Daily meetings coordinate all pre-launch operations and oversee this final part of the campaign under the direction of the launch operations manager. Inside the final assembly building, the two satellites are put in place atop the Ariane 5 inside the fairing. These operations are carried out under the supervision of Ariane Space and the satellite customer teams. UTELSAT 21B was placed in the upper position, Star 1C went in the lower berth. The two passengers are now ready for their trip into space. The day before launch, Ariane takes her last earthly ride, three kilometers on a rail track, out to her final position on the pad. And that's where she's waiting with just under five minutes to go on the pad. Inside Jupiter, other dramatis personae responsible for the mission, the satellite managers now, here on the UTELSAT side, they're responsible for the chronology. They decide if their satellite is ready for launch, following the campaign and its preparation as manager, meeting with their teams, giving the okays for each stage of their satellite's preparation. We are in the middle of this, what we said is the synchronized the sequence. Professionals here always say that these final seven minutes are the most intense moment of the entire launch campaign with about a thousand things to check and verify and monitor. Ariane Space, of course, will not authorize a liftoff unless everything is right. Satellite mission directors on the other side now for Star 1C3. We'll be hearing from Marcel, Marcelo Lavrado later on. Less than four minutes before launch, intense concentration. Tonight represents long months, years sometimes of work for many of these people all across the base. Everyone very attentive as we approach liftoff. Europe's space effort is a three-way affair among the European Space Agency, the French National Space, space, space Agency, and Ariane Space. You find them all here in Jupiter along with the customers. Another place that's very busy tonight is in the launch zone, as you can imagine, where the launch management teams are working under the direction of this man, the COEL, the launch operations manager. The COEL and his people are at this moment going over all the final checks and verifications on all parts of the launch system. They're closer to the pad than we are here in Jupiter, about a kilometer away. We're about 13, 14 kilometers away from here in Mission Control. These men and women coordinated the launcher campaign. They're monitoring the countdown right now as we speak. And they have, in fact, been working pretty much nonstop since Ariane 5's transfer to the pad. All that under the direction of COEL and all about uh, 200 people, three Ariane space managers. Once the vehicle has left the pad, their work's done. They can go home. All is going according to plan here at the space base tonight, and we know because the green status panels on the left tell us so. These are a real-time summary of the different services provided by the base, and we check them from time to time before liftoff. The panels are a go, no-go, green, red resume of everything it takes to launch. Green means okay, red means the opposite. It's very simple. If we get a red anywhere, it means somebody, someplace, has found something not quite right, and we stop the countdown. Coming up on two minutes until liftoff and very soon the guests here in Jupiter are going to be stepping outside to watch the launch. There are two balconies here with uh, a view of the launch pad which is as we mentioned 13 kilometers away and you get a good view of liftoff. This split screen shot is one of the last things you're going to see. Take a minute and just explain. This is a liquid hydrogen on the left. You saw liquid oxygen on the right. There are the propellant feeder arms going into the upper stage. You can see them there, the yellow bars in the middle of the screen going from the tower to the upper stage. These arms are part of the ground equipment and part of the launch table. The upper stage needs to be filled up up to the last minute because it's cold propellant evaporates uh, in the heat. When I say cold, liquid oxygen minus 180 degrees, liquid hydrogen minus 250 degrees. They boil off, need to be constantly refilled. So we do that up to the last minute. You hear the DDO? Who is going to call out the one minute mark and we'll be into the final 60 seconds. All that's left to explain is the ignition sequence. Here's what to watch for. The sequence begins when the cryogenic arms, you saw them a moment ago, they'll swing back at minus five seconds. At zero, the DDO will call out allumage, which is ignition, and the main engine will light up. But we don't lift off 
not quite yet. You got to count to seven for seven seconds. The computers are checking the performance in the main engine while it's burning on the gr on the ground. They check it twice to confirm it. Better to do this on the pad than once we're airborne in case they want to change anything or stop the procedures. If all is well, then and only then, the computers give the order to light the boosters. You listen to the DDO call out the final 10 seconds. A tous de DDO, attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top. Allumage bouton. Allumage EAP, décollage. Well, the cryogenic arm swung open right on time, triggering the ignition sequence. Did you count to seven? At 18.05 local, right on time, Ariane 5 began her mission, lifting off perfectly, thundering off the ground here in French Guiana, beginning mission number six for this year, carrying UTELSAT 21B and STAR 1C3. She's rising into the night sky here above French Guiana. Fine shots, as always, beautifully impressive for the people on the observation sites and on the balconies here and around the base. Right now, Ariane weighs 774 tons, 774 tons at liftoff. She's burning five tons of fuel every second, two and a half tons in each booster. Behind me, you can hear the DDO saying everything is all right. The main stage is also at the same time burning another 300 kilos of fuel per second. Ariane now following the program in the onboard computer, which is in the vehicle equipment bay in the second stage, which gives all the orders, including stage separations, which we'll soon begin to see. We're in the first of four flight phases. The first three are powered. The last is not. We'll describe each in turn and in detail, so you can follow Arian as she heads east across the Atlantic, where she'll separate the satellites after having passed over Africa. The flight phases, the first of flight phase now, the main engine and the boosters. The boosters are going to burn another 10 seconds roughly, and you'll see them flame out on the screen. Then the main engine burns alone. Then the upper stage burns alone. That looks like the flame out of the boosters. And the DDO has called out the confirmation of that. You can see the two boosters on the upper part of the screen and the, yes, the orange uh, flames of the two boosters. And the white flame is the main engine, the composite, of Ariane continuing to burn. The boosters will fall 500 kilometers from shore in a protected area. French Guiana in part chosen as a base for its opening on the water, launching, posing no threat to local population. On the left of your screen, you see the cursor climbing up uh, the line there. There are actually two lines. One is the real-time trajectory. The other is the optimal trajectory. And as long as one is on, uh, so superimposed on the other, we're right where we should be. Below that, two lines, A and V. A is altitude. We're over 100 kilometers. V is velocity. Our speed now approaching 230 kilometers per second. We need roughly around 9 kilometers per second to uh, inject the satellites, so keep your eyes on the numbers there. Both the first and second stages using cryogenic propellant. Both have single engines. We're coming up on fairing jet jettison now. The DDO has called out confirmation of that. It's in two halves. There's one half that's out of uh, camera range. The fairing protects the payload from shocks during uh, Arian's ascent through the atmosphere, and we don't need the, that protection anymore because we're out of the atmosphere and we, we don't need the 500 kilos. The Vulcan engine, roughly 50 meters, centimeters square, I should say, weighing 250 kilos, generates enough power to launch uh, Ariane 5, roughly equal to a pair of French high-speed trains, if you know the TGV system. Space Base here has become a world reference for professionalism. 
state-of-the-art facilities, the global space industry finding everything it needs here in French Guiana, low population density, we mentioned, nearness to the equator, which allows a launch to benefit from the Earth's, Earth's rotation to get to orbit more quickly, no hurricanes, earthquakes, even hills where radar can be installed to follow the launcher. Up next, a profile of Joanna Halimi on her job as launch site's operator. My name is Joanna Alimi. I'm 30 years old, and I have been with Ariane Space for the past uh, five and a half years. I studied engineering at the Belfort Montbéliard Technology College and worked for Talas Alenia Space for a year and a half. I wanted to work for Ariane Space, so I sent off an application. I was called in for the interviews and was given the job. My work consists of two different activities, one which is year-round and one which is specific to the launch campaigns. My regular job is to be in charge of the energy operations and maintenance contracts uh, for the Ariane, Soyuz and Vega launch uh, complexes. I am the technical authority and must validate the operations and maintenance plans and on-site operations carried out by the energy teams. I also follow up any anomalies that may have occurred and I check that all the operations have been carried out so that our installations are ready for the launch campaigns. During her, the launch campaign, I have some specific duties. When you begin at Yarian Space, so you get the training that will allow you to be put in charge of specialities such as uh, pyrotechnics or, or upper section electrics or, or the command and control systems of Ariane and Soyuz, and also to become an assistant uh, on all the launch sites. Today, we are in the process of connecting the thermal batteries on the solid booster. During stage uh, separation, uh, the distancing rockets will ignite. Uh, the solid boosters uh, will move away, and uh, these batteries uh, will provide uh, the energy required to swivel uh, the nozzle at the end of the thrust period and prevent a collision between the SRBs and the cryogenic main stage. After connecting the batteries at the final assembly building, we have to check that they have been properly connected uh, from the CDL3. We check uh, that the insulation and continuity of the equipment is correct. This job brings me into contact with many different people. I can work with French, German or Swiss teams uh, if I am working on Ariane depending on what I'm doing. But when I'm working on the upper composite, I can meet people from all over the world. And obviously, when I'm at the Soyuz launch site, I work with Russian teams. Therefore, I am in this way absorbed into different cultures and learn many interesting technical facts. And it is also very enriching from a human point of view. What I love about my job is that it is varied, as I work on three different launch sites, uh, Ariane, Vega, and Soyuz, and it allows me to meet lots of different people from different countries. Working for Ariane Space is above all exciting from a human point of view, and it also allows me to meet fascinating uh, technical challenges. While you were watching, that was the latest in our ongoing series of space profiles. While you were watching that, we were picked up by our first downrange tracking station over the border in Brazil, a place called Natal. The first station is here in Kuru. It's called Galio, 15 kilometers behind Jupiter, where we are, atop the Montagne des Pères. Galio sees Ariane for nine minutes before the vehicle disappears over the horizon, and it's picked up by the Natal station. That's how the downrange uh, system works. Brazil's Department of Defense runs the station for Kness in an agreement with ESA. All of Ariane Space's trajectory has been designed, of course, to be followed from the ground, whether by land or by sea. The launcher is, as we speak, sending a radar and telemetry back to a network of stations, roughly five or six of them, and they keep constant watch on the health of her vital systems. Their antennas are picking up the signals and following the process recording over 1,500 parameters, motor ignitions, shutdown stage separations, much, much more. Some of this data is analyzed in real time. Other are examined after the flight to find out how the vehicle performed. You can imagine the enormous archives that this gives Ariane Space with over 200 flights and a wealth of technical data. DDO has just called out confirmation, extinction and separation of the lower stage. You can see how that looks up there. And ignition of the upper stage. We're into the second half 
of the mission. And with that milestone, Claude Berna has arrived. Claude is Vega Program Director for Air and Space in French Guiana. Welcome. Thank you very much for welcoming me. I'm very happy to join the party. Good evening, everyone. Tell us uh, right away, i got to put you to work. What's the role of the upper stage? So the upper stage uh, is the one which brings the satellites to the correct position on the transfer orbit just before the separation from the launcher. 